So welcome to Zero to Testing in JavaScript. So I'll be covering the basics of testing in JavaScript. So that's what we have to look forward to. So about me, uh, I'm Pam Selly. Uh, places you can find me on the internet. Uh, I blog at the Web of War, Twitter, Pamasaur. Um, I made the erroneous mistake of accidentally forgetting to bring stickers to recruit you all to be members of the Philadelphia JavaScript developers. Uh, but hopefully you can forgive me and then you'll just have to come to Philadelphia and come to my user group. And I also podcast on Turing and Complete and I'm a big fan of testing. And I think it's really awesome that we have a testing track. Uh, so when I first submitted to this conference, I had no idea that, so this is the first JavaScript conference I've ever been to also that has a testing track, period. Uh, and so that's kind of insane. So let us pause for a moment and realize that we are at a JavaScript conference that has a testing track and that a lot of the talks that I saw yesterday mentioned testing as part of the way they were talking about the topic that they were presenting. If they were talking about a framework or a tool, they talked about how you test it. And I think that's really important. It's kind of, it's an important part of how JavaScript is growing up. So that, you know, it's a grown up language now and so that means we need to do grown up things like write tests. So we shall kick this off right, and so I have the, the agenda for today. So I have a whole hour, so I have a lot of stuff that we can hopefully hit. Um, so I'm going to talk about kind of how I got into testing to kind of tell a little bit of a story about how I changed my perspective on what I thought about testing, uh, talking a little bit about testing theory. So we're doing the, the real high-level basics, walking through basic tests and how you construct tests testing frameworks that you can use, so kind of the options out there and, you know, as well as my own recommendations and what I see people generally use. Other forms of testing, so when, I, when we do the testing walkthrough, we'll walk through unit testing, but that's definitely not the only kind of testing, so I'll also talk about the other forms of testing and what you can do with them. And then some tips on working testing into your workflow. So now, like since I work at a place where we do JavaScript testing on a regular basis, the kind of the tricks that you can introduce into your culture to make testing a regular thing. So my testing story. So when I first started writing tests, so I wrote my first test at a code retreat. So a code retreat is a day of intensive practice. So you follow test-driven development and you do pairing, so that's where you have two people, one keyboard, and so you might do something like one person writes a test and one person makes it pass. And so I actually didn't learn how to test at my day job. I learned in the community and practicing with other people to teach me how to test. And another key part of Code Retreat, if you are interested in hosting one, because now, so that was, I first learned testing at Code Retreat, and now I actually organize Philadelphia's Code Retreat. And one of the things you do is you throw away all your code. So you work on a project, you work on an exercise for you know, about 40 minutes or so. And when that time is up, the rules are that you have to remove uh, rm-rf, the directory that you are working on. And so it helps you detach the project work from the process. So you're actually practicing getting better at testing in a friendly, you know, fun environment where you're learning a whole lot and you get to try out new things, meet a lot of new people, and it's a lot of fun. And so then, but what about tests in my projects? So doing them at Code Retreat and doing, you know, test-driven exercises was what I did for a while, but I kind of had this perception that I thought that tests were doing the dishes. That when I first got involved in open source development, what when I went to panels on how to get involved in open source development, literally they would say, in order to get involved in open source development, you have to write tests, write docs, and fix bad code. And I was like, why, why would anyone go into open source development if that's what you tell them to do? That sounds awful. Like, basically you're telling me that tests are work that you give to people you don't like. So that kind of gave me a, a bad perception of testing, that testing was what you did if you weren't good enough to do other work. That is definitely not true. And so I read this, and I put up the image actually before the talk, and I'll show it in a second, that I was reading this interview with Julie Ralph, who's the creator of Protractor, which is a testing tool for AngularJS. And this is a long quote, so I have the, the link at the bottom, and I actually, in two, one minute, uh, the blog post should go up with this image, so it should be in the Midwest JS feed. Uh, but 
if you if you read it, it's that she talks about she said it in talks before that testing is not lettuce, that you don't do it because you should or because it's a good thing that good people do. You do it because it increases your confidence in your code. And if you think you don't, if you think you're so good that you don't need tests, maybe it's more likely that you're going to make mistakes and pay for it later. So that no one is really so good that they need to not write tests. That's just not true. So I think we should make a meme <laughs> with lettuce. <laughs> and so testing is not your lettuce. And that's Julia Ralph who said that. And I think that's really, uh, it really encapsulates kind of how I changed my mind about how I think about testing. Because I think that good developers write tests. Developers write their own tests, literally. Literally. A project that I work on has, not that I work on, but a project my team owns. Uh, we have, part of the startup scripts is when you're starting up the project, it runs the test, and literally there's an option dash B, which stands for bad coder. It might stand for something else, but it means you don't run the test. So dash B stands for bad coder. So if you don't run the test, you, my friend, might be a bad coder. So, but it's not too late. You can, you can learn to test, and increasing tests is not as arduous as it seems. Because what do you call code without tests is legacy code. So code without test means that, well, I'll talk about it in a minute, but if you don't have test, then you don't have insurance against changing your code. So it becomes this system that people don't understand and you don't know what, if you make a change, if the code will still work. So basically, when you write your test, when it breaks, it breaks. So that's the core of testing. When it's a secondary line of documentation defense and it can be, can be used as a design tool. So earlier this year, there were some conversations about that, about people not liking using testing as a design tool. But I won't get into that too much here. So if you break it and it breaks, so testing is required to enable refactoring. Because if you have a test that describes the behavior of your application, and you regularly run those tests, then you know that as you change the code that you haven't broken functionality. So tests are the way to make sure that you don't break your code by changing your code by breaking functionality by changing your code. And you use test results also to make decisions. So if you, you know, if you change something in one file and you see that it kind of has this ripple effect into other files, that gives you really valuable information about how encapsulated your code is from each other. And so by having tests, you sort of kind of, you learn more about your code by seeing your tests. And you learn a lot about your code by how easy it is to test it too. Once you start writing tests, and if you, if a, module is really hard to test, it might be too complicated. That's the thing about code is that we, we like complex, but we don't like complicated. And so, and secondary, so documentation defense. So because the definition of a test is that it describes behavior of an application, then when you get someone else's code, theoretically you should be able to read the test to understand the behavior. So when you write the test, you write the test to describe behavior so someone can read it. And then you can also write tests to validate behavior. And so the validation is more if you say you write your code and then you write your test, really you're kind of doing more validation. And that's OK, too, because that's remember, whenever you write code, you aren't writing it for yourself right now. You're also writing it for yourself six months from now, which is basically a different person. So it could also be a different person if you go off the project. But you six months from now is definitely not the same person as you are today. And of course, there's the option of using test as design tool, which then I'll talk about BDD and TDD. But if we use test to describe functionality, you write the test, which describes the functionality, and then you write the code that makes it work. You write the minimum amount of code that makes the test pass. And so when you start writing code that way, like if you go to Code Retreat, it changes kind of how you think about things. And you start writing smaller things, you make your code easier to test. Uh, which generally means that you're writing, it has like all these nice ripple effects kind of, uh, kind of, as, I guess, side effects uh, that when you use test as a design tool, it does change how you write your code. So that's why it's considered a design tool. So BDD and TDD, so behavior-driven development and test-driven development, but they can also be considered behavior-driven design and test-driven design since you're using them in a way to design how you're doing your code. So you write the test to inform how you write your code. And really, honestly, from my perspective, the difference between the two is really just a taxonomy difference. So in BDD, 
we have kind of more human words. So I describe it and have an expectation, and then you have before and after, before each and after each for your setup and teardown. And so behavior driven is supposed to, in theory, it should read more like sentences and more like when this happens, this should happen. Uh, should happen. Whereas TDD is a bit more like, it's, it's a test suite and it's a little bit more, it feels a little bit more rulesy to me. Um, but that's also probably because I've been doing, using the BDD style taxonomy for a long time and I like that. And you, you also don't have to write in sentences. You can, when I'm not feeling super creative and I'm just writing a test, I will just write the function name, describe the function, and then it, then that has a sentence. Um, so there's, you know, there's not, there's not testing police. As long as you have tests, then you're doing pretty awesome. Um, but, you know, you can make your test better over time. Because basically, when I talk about test-driven development versus behavior-driven development versus no test development, is that I'm about test ever versus test never. So having a test at some point, whether you do it first or last or somewhere in the middle, is a lot better than not having any tests. Because remember, no test means legacy code. So talking about the different types of testing. So when I go through the, the test walkthrough, I'll go through a unit test. But really, all the types of testing have kind of these same core components. But I'll talk about unit testing a little bit more. Because when we talk about testing, we end up talking about unit testing probably the most. So unit testing is testing functionality in isolation. So when I call my function, so say add numbers, it returns the value of the added numbers. So it describes the behavior of the function or the functions inside the module, and you're testing your code if it does exactly what you say it does at that modular level. So the key is that you are testing your code. So you aren't testing other people's code. Because theoretically, you should use libraries that have good test coverage. So that's another thing. So when you're evaluating frameworks and things, you always look for test coverage. Um, but so how do you only test your code? So you need to isolate and you need to fake things. How do we fake things? So uh, these are kind of the major concepts, and I won't go too deeply into them. But spy stubs and mocks. And also, it's a little bit harder in JavaScript because in, say, Jasmine, which is my favorite way to write tests, you generally use the same kind of method in order to set up kind of all of them. Uh, so you can create a spy that is also a mock kind of thing uh, in Jasmine. And so it, it becomes more of a theory thing. But when you're talking about spy stubs and mocks, this is about how you make your fake data. So a spy is an object that records its interactions. And so you can spy on a function because a function is just an object. So when you spy on a function and you, you can watch, the test framework will let you see if it has been called, what parameters it was called with, without calling through to the function. And one of the reasons why these kind of things are also really valuable is for, say, test-driven development, you can create a module and you can spy on the behavior of a function you haven't written yet. So you can actually do that, too. And so you aren't calling through your functions, so you actually are creating your, your code in isolation so that you test just the code that you're writing. Stubs are fake objects. Uh, so you can also, stubs versus fixtures are kind of an, another thing. So fixtures are kind of like preloading data. Um, a stub is a, a fake object. And so, and then a mock is a fake object with an expected behavior. So if you have a spy based, like so if you have a, a spy on an object and then you have it return something, then it has a fake behavior. So if, you, if you'll do that if you're, say, calling some other function that you, you need as result, which you, you know, a lot of times that happens. And so then you are testing in isolation because your module will expect a specific result from that module, and then that module is separately tested on its own to make sure it's giving those kinds of results. So, and I generally, this is the statement I kind of use, is that you spy on a function, you stub an object, and you mock a service. And it's one of those things that kind of comes with, with use and time, uh, but it's good stuff. So integration testing. So integration testing is the next level up from unit testing, meaning you're testing multiple pieces of code together. So that's actually when you would call through a function. And so if your router is setting up your models correctly, so you're calling your router, and then you're looking at it in another piece of the code. You aren't mocking the model creation process. You're actually going to call through it and then inspect those things. 
uh, integration testing is kind of in the middle, and I think that unit testing and functional or end-to-end -end testing are the ones that are kind of the key to, if you're going to prioritize them, integration is, I haven't seen it that much in practice, uh, so it, it doesn't get as much of a priority as unit test coverage and end-to-end -end test coverage. Functional testing is testing your code against functional requirements, so does your code work as the product expects it to? So if the business has functional requirements, uh, then you describe these behaviors and then run a test to test against your expectations. So when you click a login button, it should log me in. And functional tests are marginally different from an end test, and some of it is a little bit semantic, but an end test theoretically it's the true like a user, like call through everything. And so you could even, you sometimes people write and end test against production code and run them say once a day or once an hour. Uh, and then that, you know, sets up alarms if say a service you're integrated into goes down. So you don't have to get that bad news from a user. You can find it automatically by seeing that something isn't on the page where it should be or some functionality didn't work. So end-to-end -end testing, that's why end-to-end -end testing becomes one of those kind of minimum levels of testing that you want to have. So let's walk through a JavaScript test. So also we'll, I'll talk about the kind of basics of the components of a test. So the first thing you do is you set up your base and then you write the test and expectations and make it pass. The order of those is debatable because of TDD. However, it's fine, whichever way you do it. I honestly kind of go back and forth. So depending on my mood, I'll write, I, I was working on a project recently where it was, um, I was setting up the data models, and I really like user interaction, and so I was setting up the data models for a website, and so, and when I didn't have a lot of other stuff, so I was basically kind of writing the architecture before there was anything to architect on, and so I wrote a whole suite of tests, and so as that stuff is getting filled in, people can uncomment the test to validate the behavior of what it's doing. So, so that's actually, I did more test driven, whereas sometimes I'll, you know, cheat and write the behavior and then write a test. But then I might do things like pass bad data and see what happens when I pass bad data and make sure that that's, so I write additional tests to ensure that I get the full functionality I'm expecting. So in the walkthrough, I'm going to use the, the Jasmine uh, kind of, I want to call it a DSL, but I don't think it is. Uh, but Jasmine is a, a full testing framework, uh, but you see Jasmine used a lot in other testing frameworks because it's the, the language in which you describe your test. So I kind of call it a test describer because uh, there's a few kind of test describers. So you can download a standalone version of Jasmine from Pivotal Jasmine, and that's, if you aren't a Node person, I know we had a lot of Node stuff here, but if you aren't, and you're just kind of interested in JavaScript development or you're moving into JavaScript development from other stuff and you are more used to developing in a browser, uh, downloading the standalone version gives you an HTML test runner. And at least for Code Retreat, because I think it's really awesome because I get a lot of people at Code Retreat who are like me at my first Code Retreat who have never written a test. And so I'll start them out in the HTML test runner, which feels a lot more accessible to them because they get all the tools that they are used to in the browser. They get dev tools and they can drop debugger statements in and all that kind of thing. And they get visual output. So that's pretty, pretty helpful to people new to it. And you can also get Jasmine Node, which funnily enough is a fork of Karma Jasmine. Karma is another test runner, is a test runner. Uh, but if you want to run just, ja just Jasmine and not use the Karma test runner, there is a package for it. And so then in this uh, test example, I'm going to use Mocha as the, the test runner, uh, but it's also kind of the test describer. And so you get Node, uh, Mocha with NPM installed globally Mocha. Uh, so, and it's one of the test frameworks for Node that's kind of a bit magic. It has a ton, a ton of features. Uh, so, and it, you know, hashtag just works. So I actually do meet some Node people who aren't big fans of Mocha. And so they prefer ones that have a little bit less magic. However, I think Mocha is definitely great to start out with, and it has also some funny test runners. Um, but that's fun. There's a Neon Cat uh, test output runner. Um, so it's pretty fun. But so when you're writing a test, the anatomy of a test, 
So you describe the thing you're testing, it does something you expect it to do, and then you set within the it, there's an expectation or multiple expectations that you have. So you might have like, you know, in terms of the examples of multiple expectations, I might expect something to have been called, and then I might have a second expectation that might be I expect it to have been called twice because of the way I pass parameters to it. So that's, that's how you might have multiple expectations. And that is how you write tests. It's just a description and an expectation. So you do that over and over again, and those are your tests. It's really, it's not as complicated as it seems. And it, it has a great output for the longevity of your code and the confidence you have in your code. So onto the example test walkthrough. So this is with Mocha. So ver assert require assert. So in Mocha, you mention your, you can change which assertion library you use. So that's, you can have different um, references for that. So if you have written unit tests in other languages and you have a kind of, some people have a way that they like to do it, you can always build your own kind of thing in JavaScript. Uh, so you can require assert or you can require should um, and then use those as your expectations. So in the description, this is describe an area of my application. So it's using human words uh, to describe an area of my application. And then I think this actually always trips up people who are new to JavaScript unit testing. And JavaScript testing in general is that because JavaScript tests are written in JavaScript, uh, it's, all, uh, it's all strings and then callbacks. And so if you're getting started, sometimes that's, ah, it's going nuts. Okay, sorry. I tried to remove these timings and I apparently failed. Okay, so functions. And then it should know the two and two is four because hopefully that's still true. And it passes and goes really fast. So there's an assertion there, two and two, so the first parameter, and then the second is the result that you expect, and then Mocha test runner, one passing. So, cool. All right, I'm seeing if it's gonna auto advance me. Okay. All right, so testing tools. So test describers. So when I was saying that a lot of the, so Jasmine is a full testing framework, but I kind of think of these as test describers because these are the different libraries where when you write your test, it looks a little different. So I kind of call them test describers, even though most of these are really fully fledged test frameworks. So Jasmine has a BDD style syntax, so describe, it, expect. Um, Mocha, uh, we just saw a Mocha test. You can uh, modify it a bit. Uh, and then QUnit is, uh, I know Ember, I believe, uses QUnit, and NodeTap is kind of the popular test description and test runner for Node people, and YUI test is, I guess, popular if you work at Yahoo. Um, but I did include it because I read a book on uh, testable JavaScript, and all the examples were written in YUI test, so I thought it was still relevant. So I mentioned that when you use something like Mocha, uh, you can change your assertion. So you can use regular old assert, and, but there's also lots of other assertion libraries. So if you're the kind of person who has, you know, wants to roll their own kind of thing, because that's the way you are, uh, you can use assertion libraries because if you remember that the basic anatomy of a test is just a description, an expectation, then anyone can write their own test framework because as long as you use some kind of assertion, then you can, you know, you can run that test and get test uh, failure or a success. So these are the different assertion libraries, and so you can check them out. Uh, all the slides have links, uh, so you can click them and, and go explore those different libraries. So most of the, since a lot of those are, back in the test describers are fully fledged testing frameworks, they generally kind of have you covered for spy stubs and mocks, However, there are a couple tools if you run into the limits of those. So seen on is kind of the, the best of breed for spy stubs and mocks. It's, it was written by the person who wrote the test-driven JavaScript book. So it's kind of, uh, you know, it's a pretty good library, you would think. Uh, and so and it's really useful if, say, you need to mock through a large API. 
uh, rather than individually spying on things which can get really tedious. So it can be really useful. Uh, Jest is a, uh, a mocking framework from Facebook that sits on top of Jasmine. And what Jest does is it auto-magically, we call it auto-magically rather than automatically, because it, uh, it goes through and mocks everything by default. That is how it is default set up. And so in order to test something, you have to tell Jest not to mock it. So it's an interesting approach. Uh, I actually did a little sample on my GitHub of running through it and kind of trying to, to break it a little bit. Um, so it's kind of interesting. And I would be interested to see if more people use Jest, because especially it's Facebook uses Jest to test React. So if you're interested in React, you can see examples of using Jest for React. Uh, but I like the philosophy, but it does, it does do kind of one specific thing, and it sits on top of Jasmine. And as for test runners, kind of my, my favorite as it is, is Karma. So the Karma test runner uh, from the Angular folk. Um, it is really, really easy to get started. And so at the end of this talk, uh, at the end of the, the slide portion of our program, um, I'm actually going to set up a Karma project. We'll set up a few tests and try and complicate things until we get bored. Uh, and so Karma is kind of the, my favorite of, of choice these days. And then Testum is another test runner that uh, other people use. I don't know that much about it. And then YUI Yeti is again written for people who work at Yahoo probably. But uh, in terms of test runners, and Mocha obviously, we saw that Mocha has a test runner. Jasmine has a browser test runner and other packages that you can use. Uh, if you are using, uh, if you have your project in, say, another language other than JavaScript, if you are using, say, a Ruby on Rails project, there's going to be different test runners specific to that kind of environment. So for Ruby on Rails, which I write in pretty often, we use Teaspoon for the test runner because it integrates really well into Rails. So, so now that you're all testing fanatics, how do you bring testing into the fold? So this, the three, three things that I do on my team to make testing something that we do all the time. So uh, number one, teaching testing. So I think it's great that you all are here um, and crazy that we have a whole testing track. So you all be in such a position to help your teams learn about this. And so maybe you can give a lightning talk to your team when you get back about all the awesome things you learned about testing. Um, maybe you can run a code kata, which is kind of like a mini code retreat where you just run like one problem. Like say, you, say you're gonna write, uh, I did a code kata recently where it was bowling scores. So you were writing a, a score for bowling, which is, it, it's, like, it's complicated, it's small enough but complicated enough that you won't finish it in the allotted amount of time because of you know, strikes and spares and all that kind of thing and how you decide to take input. Uh, so practicing testing is how you get better. And then pair programming is the method that you can use with two people, one keyboard. If you, you know, have one person who understands testing and one person who is learning, then it's a practice time of mentorship where people can learn. So code coverage is a big deal. And so I, after the, the slide portion, I have, because I just didn't want to switch back and forth, uh, I have uh, some examples of Istanbul and Blanket.js. Um, because I think code coverage is a really, it's a, it's a good way to encourage testing behavior. It is a little bit of a vanity metric too. So it is, you know, taken with a grain of salt. Uh, so your goal isn't necessarily 100% test coverage because that kind of, you get a little nut if you start getting around the 90s. Uh, but in practice, what, what kind of the experts say, the good level is if, you're, if your threshold is above like 75%. So if you're in like the high 70s, 80s, then that's a good coverage level. Because at a certain point, you're going to be testing like, did the initialize function fire? Um, which, you know, you can test it. Uh, it is possible. But at a certain point, you get into like the, the endless loop of like some code has to call it, and then how do you test that code? Uh, so code coverage above, above 75, like so upper 70s, low 80s is kind of the minimum threshold you want to set. And setting so that code coverage drops break the build also a good thing to do. So that not only do you only accept code that uh, has tests in it, you also cause a build failure if someone committed code that then dropped the test coverage. So they get a, an automatic failure before you even have to do code review. 
which is our next topic. So code review is when, in order to merge into master, someone else looks at your code. So if you don't do code review, uh, please do. Uh, it's really easy to get set up doing it. It's as simple as if you use, say, GitHub as saying before you merge a pull request, you have to have two thumbs up before it gets merged. So code review is really one of the easier things to implement on a team that doesn't have it. It's a way to improve quality because you know that I actually, I always get annoyed if I look up a patch that where I'm like, how did that get in there? And then I find out that I reviewed it. That's justice, my friends. So if I'm responsible for it, I'm respons even though someone else wrote it, I'm responsible for it getting in the code base. So it's an opportunity for mentoring, for sharing your knowledge with people, for people kind of in a low stakes environment, you know, kind of learning learning different things of like, huh, it's interesting you did it that way, why did, why'd you do it that way instead of this way? That kind of thing. And that could be a person trying to learn asking the question or, you know, someone asking the question and trying to teach. It can go both ways because I've, I've learned both ways. I'll see someone do something kind of interesting and wonder how they learned that technique or what exactly it does. And so it's a pretty, pretty neat way to learn. And, of course, code review that you if you don't, if you, a great way to increase your test coverage is any new code that's written, if it doesn't have tests, you don't accept it. And so when you implement that rule, your test coverage goes up really fast. So we started a project recently on my team, and we were dash B bag coders, and we started out without some tests, but then we kind of started blocking and saying, like, no, we've, we're, we're far enough into this that if you write something new um, or add to it, add to a module or move a module around, it needs to have tests so that as we move those things around, then we aren't breaking things. And in, in something like three days, we went from like 10% coverage to like 70% coverage uh, just because we just added tests like crazy. So what did we learn in the, the first part of our presentation? So the basics of testing, uh, writing a JavaScript test, tools in JavaScript for testing, and ways to create a testing culture. So we went over a lot already. And then what I'm going to do is show you the test coverage stuff because I just didn't want to toggle between things. Uh, and then we will do a mini shop slash workshop, play shop, um, of writing tests. Uh, so I will set up Karma with Jasmine and start writing some tests and hopefully add a little bit of complexity as we go. And maybe you guys can talk and help me out with doing some stuff, because that would be neat. And you can ask a bunch of questions, and we can try and break everything. Um, so that should be a lot of fun. So let's exit out of the oldie PowerPoint. So I wanted, I wanted to make sure I showed you. So because so in terms of test coverage tools, I really like Istanbul is my, what I would consider best of breed. I used to have actually like three more things on those slides besides uh, Istanbul and Blinkit, and I dropped them because really Istanbul and Blinkit seem to be the ones that people still use. Uh, and Istanbul really is just, it's just fantastic because, so code coverage uh, at the, the brute force mechanism is lines of code. However, Istanbul gives you lots of other forms of coverage. So statements, branches, functions. So how many functions are covered? That kind of makes sense. How many lines? That's pretty obvious. How many statements? So in JavaScript, we have statements, right? So you might have a line of code that, uh, a statement that goes over more than one line. So it's the percentage of statements that are covered. And then I love branches because it actually, so there's, where can we see the, this one says, so this is Istanbul testing Istanbul. So this is, looks like a, so the, a branch is when the else path or the if path isn't taken. So if you have an if statement and you write a test that only tests if when the if statement is true, you'll get a coverage uh, drop because you aren't covering all your branches because you need to test when it's false. So stuff like that. Oh, look at this. Interesting. Guys. So this, these whole statements are not covered, so this case is not covered in Istanbul. So you can kind of see those things. So even, even Istanbul, this is a good point, that even Istanbul does not have 100% coverage. So you don't have to beat yourself up about it. I did get in an obsessive week one time where I really wanted to get 100% coverage, and I did it, but then I've, I've gotten over it since. So Blanket.js uh, is code coverage library, and so this you'll see it in QUnit, and then at the bottom, at the bottom you see the coverage. And so that's just lines of code coverage. And so that's why I see Istanbul is pretty much the best of breed, and when you get say, plugins for Karma, 
uh, for Karma Test Runner, and it uses coverage, is generally going to be Istanbul, because Istanbul is a, a great coverage tool that people extend and add into other things. So, so now we're going to do some crazy stuff, and because I'm doing it like completely live coding. Um, okay, so I did make the directory, so I'm going to make. Is this is this big enough? We're in a small room. Shake your head if you are unhappy with the size. Okay, no one. All right, so let's make a source directory and spec. And so in JavaScript, there's not necessarily, I don't see necessarily a uh, kind of a standard of practice around which way you want to do it. I'm used to spec because spec is specification, so you kind of use it in BDD. Uh, some frameworks specifically expect you to use a slash test directory. Uh, so like kind of some of the magic ones, like I believe, I think Mocha is a, a test directory. Um, I'd have to look at my sample I have in here. But so now we have our two directories. And so let's have a little cheat sheet. Oh, wait. So let's uh, do the thing where we make our package.json first. So that we can have NPM do all our work. The what? Okay. So that's easier, I'm guessing? Yeah. Okay, cool. Ah! Ah! Edit anyway. <laughs> so now when I do NPM, I can do the dash dash save so it saves my stuff. Uh, save dev. And then I want to add my test describer, so I'm going to add Jasmine. Cool. And let's see if I did that right. Yeah, cool. So, and the beauty of how just how easy Karma is to run is that it's node modules, Karma, then Karma, init, and then it has a convenient walkthrough. You can literally not mess this up. Uh, so it's really awesome because Karma is configured with one of those grunt style long JSON config files. So this sets it up for you. So you don't have to learn how to do that. So Jasmine, we are going to use required JS. I don't want to use Chrome, I'm going to use uh, Phantom. It defaults to Chrome because it's made by Google. Uh, how do I make it? I made it source. So these are the, the files that it's going to load in the test runner. So you don't have to, so in other, if you roll your own test kind of framework, you might have to require a file as a dependency in your test file so that it's loaded so you can test it. If you use a test runner, Part of what Karma does is it just does that for you. So it's kind of, it's, it's basically loading it into a fake page. If you look at how the HTML test runners work, it is pretty similar. So if you look at how standalone Jasmine works, where you load your source files, and like literally you have the comments, so you see load source files, load test files, um, after you load Jasmine, of course. Uh, and so it works kind of in a similar way. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's actually what I'm going to do for um, spec. So I'm going to do spec star slash star.js. Was that what you were asking? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, you can glom. Yeah. Yeah, that's as far as I know. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing 
risks that we have run into in, in Karma is if you do GLOM, it loads things in alphabetical order. So that can cause issues sometimes. So something to be aware of if you have your files depend on one another being loaded. And you can exclude files, so you can, I guess, exclude an external library that you're going to mock out. Do you want Karma to watch on and run the test on change? So that's, this is setting the single run option, so I can show that in the, in the Karma comp. So. so single run false, so that's what that's setting. So if it's true, it runs the test and exits. Uh, so single run false means that when I run Karma, that it will just, it will keep running kind of like a, a, a grunt watch kind of thing. So if I, and you, I, so Karma also has an, a global, I just don't have that one installed and I'm just showing the, you can run it within your directory, um, but you can install Karma globally so that you can just write Karma and start. Okay. So execute is zero, 0, and there's an error because it's unhappy. So I'm going to use Sublime, and I should change this color. That is still black. Ah. OK. So let's make a source file, or sorry, let's do BD, and we're going to make a spec file. So let's just do the simple uh, add numbers Well, I'll call it add. OK, so I, yep, that's in the right place. So describe, let's just call it, let's do the, the cheating method that I kind of mentioned where I'm just going to use the name of the function that I'm going to make. So, and this is a, in Jasmine, this is called a matcher. And so you get a number of matchers. Uh, a good number of them are pretty close to two equal, but you can also use 2B. Um, and you can also use, so I can also run an expectation. Not. And so that's how you do negations in Jasmine, is just a dot not. So pretty nice. And so my karma should be running over here. And so I have a failure and can't find variable add numbers. So in completely test driven development, it literally cannot find the add numbers, so I need to go create that. So I'm creating in response to the failure of my test. So add.js. And so notice that in kind of the naming scheme that for mine, since I use the underscore spec, um, I have the name of the file and then underscore spec. And so I have the match. Interesting thing, some people that I've met keep their spec files next to their source file. And I think that's really interesting. And then they just have the build process kind of rip it out. And I think that's really cool because they're keeping their tests really close to their source code. It's an interesting strategy. It's definitely not ubiquitous, but I do find it very interesting. So that, let's see, yep, that passed because I just had it return five. So maybe I should add another expectation. So that's the the evil TDD game that you sometimes play in uh, Code Retreat is where you literally have the function do exactly what the test said it would do. And then you add logic as you 
as you test out the expectations. So now we should get and then executed one and one success. So, oh, wow, that went by really fast. Um, so we, we have time, so what are some things that you guys might want to see done? So I had some ideas, but we can, we can respond to what your questions are, because we have about, about 10 minutes left, so it's kind of, it's question time. So we can ask questions, and I can, it can be related to the material, or we can write out tests, too. Huh? Async or event. So, um, so I'm gonna. No, no, no. It's definitely not. But I mean, I don't. I don't think I can write something that runs with that right now. But I can mock it out. What? Well, not mock in the proper sense. Yeah, you understand. <laughs> so, um, so let's just wrap it in a comment so that I. But so uh, when I'm doing a testing asynchronous code, so I might describe uh, an event handler. That kind of thing. Literally, it can be as easy as, um, so it um, fires when the event fires. And so, uh, let's say I want to spy on um, So that's a spy, so that's an object where I'm going to watch its interactions. So then I spied on it, and then I can uh, trigger, like however you want to trigger an event. I mean, there's umpteen ways. Um, but so trigger my fancy event, and then expect my, my module that my handler to have been called. So that should work, that kind of thing. The trigger is not written correctly because I don't remember off the top of my head how to necessarily do that. But uh, that's one way we, we test things. Say if we, so I have a project that uses an external library and it is an event-based library. Uh, so it, like, it, it runs in its own kind of environment, but it fires events and messages and we fire back and forth. And so when I'm running, because remember they're supposed to be fully tested, and so I'm running my test, so I'll fire one of their events and see how my code is reacting in my unit test. So, other questions? Things you want to do? Okay. Do you mean like in the direction of functional testing and end to end testing? That's a really interesting use case. Sorry. Yeah. So that. But you can you can mock you can mock systems though. There's like mock mock Arduinos. So theoretically you could create mocks of other things. So it's not browsers, so you can't use Selenium. But theoretically you could create fake systems that act like the other systems. Yeah. 
Mm. You're talking about load testing then. Okay. Yeah. That sounds like load testing. Yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah, I I don't have much on that because I think kind of your your question about this being developer centric is that I, I would agree because it is insurance for it, this kind of testing is for developers to ensure what they wrote. And so that's the kind of testing it is. That's why it sounds like some of what you're looking for is load testing, where you get a, kind of you get a sample size, essentially. And then you're doing analytics on the sample size. Um, and so you can, you know, you can run a regression and see the correlation between things and the factor. And yeah, and so that's, that, is, that is not my realm of expertise. But I do know, like, at least, and also since you're saying it's not for browsers, I know that um, Locust.io is one of the load testing ones for web stuff. But I don't know how useful that is to you for the kind of embedded systems you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> What's it called? Hexawise? Okay. Oh, yeah, and you could, yeah, if you're on the Twitter, you could tweet it on the hashtag, too. Oh, okay. Well, someone <laughs> could tweet it on the hashtag. All right. Cool. So, uh, so we're about out of time, so I'll let you guys, it is now a snack break. So uh, thanks for coming to my talk. I hope you, I'll be around. So thank you for coming. <laughs>